Now, the other thing that I picked up on before starting was there's a big fight here between Hong Kong and Singapore. So I was sitting on my edge there thinking, right, how do I promote Stockholm in all of this? Because Stockholm is really a great city, right? And, and there's kind of the, the, the telling all the people that's living here, all the mega trends and how they're affecting things. So I was kind of thinking, what was Sweden? We haven't got the, the number of people that Hong Kong has in all of Sweden, so how am I going to make this exciting? Then all of a sudden, I was being jumped at being a bad driver as well. I thought, what's this all about? We haven't even gone in a car together. So I thought, are you assuming all Sweden? Are bad drivers as well. So, so, what I'd like to make out of all of this is really, I mean, if, if you're kind of getting fed up with all the trends every now and then, come to Sweden. We're a small country, not many people, and, and you know, we still take great pride in driving vehicles, not just having them driving around for us. So, it might be a nice vacation from all the big trends, right? And the other thing about Sweden is we're really great at ice hockey. There's people there, I think, from Finland, some I see, and, and, and potentially Slovaks and things like this. So, so you know, it might just be good to, to remember that um, even a small country can be great at some things, Petri. One thing, the best thing in Sweden is your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Petri says the best thing in our, 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 our region there is the neighbors, and yeah. We should rely on our partners, so our neighbors is not bad. They let us win all the time, and that's quite nice of them. So, um, I will spend the next 30 minutes, potentially slightly shorter than that, to talk a little bit about Lean. And I was speaking about Lean about 30, well, a year ago, um, talking about some of the aspects of how we build a strong organization using Lean. And I will come back to that today. Because when we think about how we're actually going to capture these challenging future trends that Manoy was talking about, you know, our core tool and what all our leaders know is that the organization and the people in our organization is the way that we will capture future opportunities. And this is where Lean is such a crucial item. And I wanted to pick up on what, uh, what Hanno said in his initial speech. His third key success factor was flexibility. And flexibility is really important in organization. Because if we have the organizational flexibility to adapt to changing behaviors, to new trends that kicks up, we also have the opportunity to win the race to capture those trends and be first out there. And flexibility comes basically from the basis of standardization. There cannot be flexibility unless there's a base standard. If you do not have base standard in anything, you get chaos when you try to be flexible. But if you have base standard, off the back of the base standard, you can allow yourself to be flexible. So what does this mean in organizational terms? Well, in organizational terms, the way we try to think about building an organization that is ready to be innovative is basically to go through three stages. We start by creating a healthy organization. We make sure that our organization is actually capable of, of meeting the minimum requirements to do good. That we have no sanitation issues where we're not performing because we're upset or, or not functioning the way we should. When we have the base requirements of a well-functioning organization in place, we focus our attention to build an ex basically a, an organization that can execute strategies. We focus on the policy deployment. We focus on making sure that our strategy is understood clear and that we have all the abilities to execute it efficiently. I see you're getting tired. You get one of these just to keep, uh, whoop, to keep good motion, right? Thank you. Do not eat it like Petra did. Um, the last thing we do is, when we've built an organization which is healthy, which is doing well, which is enjoying life, we try to make sure that the organization is executionable. The next thing we do is we make it face outwards. We make it ready to pick up these trends. I, I tend to see this, this mega trends, opportunities. It's, it's almost like little things that keeps flowing through the air. All these opportunities. And our organization needs to be capable to pick up here and, and kind of let the opportunity hit us. And if it does, opportunity happens. And if it does, we need to have the organization that can quickly elaborate our way forward, change our motion, and capture this opportunity. And we will not do that unless we first have a good standard for an organizational performance, then build the ability to execute that performance. And that's what we will talk about today. Now, before going into that, let me show you a model. There's, there's, um, 
lots of interesting thinking about organizational performance. Um, but one of the difficult items in this is linking it to financial performance. And the good folks at McKinsey, they did an approach trying to do this where they basically evaluated 250 companies. Um, for each of those companies, they worked with um, 100 reference companies to benchmark their financial performance. They worked with a total of 115,000 individuals in these companies, trying to see if there was a link between organizational performance and financial performance. The, the short answer is yes, there's a link. Um, and I think we all know that. That's why leaders always say capability of the organization is the most important thing. But it's easy to fall tempted by the short-term satisfaction of achieving short-term EBIT targets, which means it's easier to do the improvements to make the, the targets hit every year than to make the long-term sustainable improvements of building a strong organization. But it's not okay to just do the one. We have to do both. So this model, there's several models. I like this model a lot in terms of describing organizational performance. It has nine items that we consider for an organization to be healthy and to be successful. And the way you can think of this is basically if you meet the minimum on all of these aspects, all these aspects of an organization, you have a base health in the organization. There's a, a huge audit behind it that you can do and apply on a company. But if you meet the base minimum on all of this, you will have an organization that is reasonably successful. It will not work against you. But then you can become really good at a few of these items and really succeed in them, and it will really bring your performance up. And I will show you a few examples of how that can work. But one interesting item, for instance, is motivation. Now, we always talk about motivating our employees, motivating our organizations to do great things. The, the interesting thing that this, this analysis has shown is actually motivation, if you have uh, basically a, a bottom tier performance, if you're not one of the top performing companies for motivating your organization, it has a very negative impact on your financial performance. If you're the top performer, if you're a really strong company that really focuses on driving motivation to your organization, you will have twice as high likelihood of being top tier financial, financial performance. Anywhere in between doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference if you invest a little bit in some exciting things to bring motivation into your company, it will not make a difference. So you either go all the way and create a really motivated organization and get really good benefit from it, or you best just not do that much at all because it won't give you that much tangible difference to do just small improvements. So this is important. When we look at these different aspects, um, you, you cannot be the best there is on all of them. You can be the best there is on maybe three or four, and, and worst, well, in best cases, five. But no organization that we saw had top-tier financial performance actually managed to be on top performance on more than five of these aspects. You cannot. It'll be difficult. So the link here really, really to lean is lean is our way of building an organization and building an efficient, effective, and well-functioning organization. This is really what it's all about for me and how we think about making sure that we will always achieve our strategies. When we apply that, it looks differently in every type of process we go, but as long as we make sure we build capabilities in a learning organization, we will keep capturing those opportunities and keep winning the race to, to kind of get towards the mega trends that Manoy is talking about. So, so this model, I'll show you a few of the financial links. So it's something called the missing link. It's, um, it's, um, uh, I think it's available on the internet if you wanted to read the full article. It's a very good presentation made by a few previous colleagues of mine. Um, but if you look on these links, basically the way the study is made is they've split companies into organizational efficiencies in four quadrants. A bottom performing quadrant of organizational performance, a top performing um, section, and then two middle sections, middle quadrants. And they've done the same on EBITDA performance, where they benchmarked um, companies in, in the same industry. So bottom performing, top performing, middle performing. And if you see the average result, it kind of shows you that if you're a top performing, top tier performing organizational company, your organization is top performing, you are two, two times more likely, or 2.2 times more likely, to be a top performing financial company. Vice versa does not work, so it only works in the relation that if you build a stronger organization, you improve your financial performance. And this is a very, very detailed study that's behind this. It's a lot of very interesting facts that comes out of this. But it's also very interesting to see the link to financial performance between individual items. You have some linear, Linear relationship means improve a little bit on, uh, for instance, capability building, and you immediately improve pretty much the same on financial performance. 
but it does mean that you have to improve capabilities that's needed for your business. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense, right? So if you do improve some needed business skills in terms of capabilities, you will see a financial effect of that. Other items, as I touched on with motivation, you must at least be um, you know, in the top quartile to really see a good performance effect of it. But vice versa, if you're on, on bottom quartile, you have a very big negative effect from it as well. And then you have other items, which um, external communication, actually leadership is interesting as well. Leadership, you need to be above minimum, but actually you don't need to be a top performing company in terms of the leadership itself. Because you can have other aspects of this that helps to strengthen the leadership. Uh, but it's very interesting to consider these, and very interesting as well is to understand that no company is the other one alike. So the combination of things that you are top in for one successful company will not be the same as another comp uh, successful company. Take all of the, the, the companies that Manoy was mentioning in terms of Apple and Google. They're really strong in a few of these actions, or in a few of these areas. Um, it was particularly around motivation and, and culture, climate, capability, innovation and learning, which drives a very sort of flat structure with a lot of motivation coming from the individual achieving targets. Whereas more traditional organizations that I tend to work a lot with in automotive are very much driven and successful by clear accountability, by making sure that they have clear direction and making sure that they have coordination and control. And there's a kind of quick fix here that, that works short term in organizations. If you want to really turn around performance quickly, you make sure you strength, strengthen your uh, you know, accountability the follow-up that you do on coordination and control, and you strengthen basically the uh, um, capability. If you do these three things, you can quickly turn around performance in an organization, and if you turn around organizational performance, you get the effect of financial performance. However, there's some danger to that. Focusing only on these has the tendency of becoming short-term. So you get some benefit short-term, but then it fades away a little bit over time. So, so for that reason, it's very sensitive to remember what's our company, what's our values, and how do we need to sort of build this compared to where we are. Okay? Yeah, oof, I like that. That's a chocolate. It's interactive. Who said yes? Oh, you did. You get it. Nice one. So, um, in terms of looking at this model, if we think of these three steps, basically what we're going to do is, um, we're going to first of all make sure we have a healthy organization, so align the basics. I'll give you a few examples of how that works and a few examples of how it doesn't work. Actually, is anyone French in here? Come on, I saw a few French people yesterday. Oh, at least one France, French person. Now, you're going to get one of these, and that's because I'm sorry for what I will say in two slides from now about uh, France and uh, the business culture in France. Uh, so, it's kind of excusing on beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll come back to that. You'll see why, why you actually got that one. And uh, if you're still upset afterwards, let's discuss. Um, but basically, when we want to build a stable culture in the organization, what we tend to do is we focus on three of these areas. And they've always worked very well for me when I want to make sure that I get a healthy organization in place, which is maybe turning something that's not working so well, that's kind of turmoiling, um, into something that works better. First of all, I put focus on three of these aspects. I put focus on the direction, on the leadership, and on, on the culture and, and um, climate. Because these three things help me to align the organization. And aligning the organization is the absolute best way there is to get out of a situation where we're kind of counting. Um, what happens is I, I visited many management teams last, say, two years, um, probably 50 different management teams. And in absolutely all of those, the management team were not aligned on what they were going to achieve. There was a vision, there was a strategy, but the management teams for the sites I went to had different ways to reach the strategy. And what do you think is the effect of a management team all having different plans to how to achieve basically the same targets? Will they cooperate? No, they will not cooperate. They will go in different directions, right? And the effect of that is they send signals to the rest of the plants to also go in different directions because the leaders are not doing it, so they're not role modeling the behavior, right? So, one of the first things we do in this case is we make sure that the leaders are aligned, aligned, that there is a direction from the company where we're heading that everyone can understand and relate to. And then we start to focus about the leadership, about how we could actually role model this behavior, how we could role model that direction that we want to go. And this single item does so much. And if we can communicate and convey where we're heading and why we're taking certain actions, it does so much for turning around a non-functioning organization to something that becomes a functioning organization. Such a very important item. And the next one, around culture and climate, um, this is quite an interesting one as well. Uh, really, if you want to link the direction to 
why you are existing, what the values of your organization is, that has a tremendous effect for the well-being of the organization. And there's so many companies, I, I see Enix, you, you also have the value set, right, the, the five Enix values. And most companies start to work with values to try to describe the culture and the climate of an organization, so how we should be working right. Now, one of the challenges with that, and the same happened, Toyota had great problems with this. They used the Toyota way, I'm sure you've seen it before, right? Well, at least for the ones who were in Malmo one year ago, I shown this one then as well. But in 2001, Toyota came to the situation that they said, oh, this is not working at all. In Japan, everything is very nice, but when we go to Europe or our, our, Asian, uh, our, our US factories, it doesn't work. People do not understand the values and culture of our company. They are not working the way that we want them to be working and the way we want them to approach our business challenges. Why is that? And they said, ah, we need, to, we need to convey, we need to explain our values. So the most senior senseis of Toyota, they went out, they spent a lot of time in focus groups with the organization. They tried to understand how the organization was thinking and approaching business problems. They tried to learn and they came back and they said, huh, our organization does not understand our organization. We have a problem. And this was a big problem for them. So they created Toyota Way as a formalized way of describing that these are the values we should basically be applying when we uh, sort of go about our work. They tried it. It didn't work. People still didn't understand it. Our practice was in France and, and the UK, and, and, and uh, typically French and UK people are very uh, narrow-minded in, in their culture, and they didn't want to adopt the Toyota culture, really. But um, what they then did was, in, in 2004, they launched something called the Toyota Business Practice, where they tried to basically convey the values in terms of a way of working. And this had tremendous effects. It instantly gave the result that Toyota wanted to have. When they talked about values, people could not relate the values to their work. They did not see the link between the values they had and the way that they should work with the values. But when Toyota created Toyota business practice to support Toyota Way, everyone instantaneously understood it. Toyota business practice is practically problem solving. It's a seven step process of how to solve a problem. And for Toyota, who's Effortless, whose journey is always to find the Muda, eliminate the Muda, identify opportunities for improvement by identifying problems, it made sense. The whole culture is about identifying problems or abnormalities, resolving abnormalities. So when they put down on words that the way you should approach every business challenge or situation you have is by applying the thinking of problem solving, all of these items came to life. We understood the challenge. The challenge is really every abnormality you identify, every muda that comes your direction, is a great challenge, a great opportunity, because you get the opportunity to do improvement. You get the opportunity to drive organizational performance. They understood how Kaizen linked in all those small improvements, every small muda we identified and improved, they could see how that related to the process and got it further on. It related to Genshi Genbutsu, which is go and see, or, or, or basically to a larger extent Sen Genshugi, or building a learning organization. They understood how building their evidence-based approach and, and finding facts to solve problems linked in. With, with the process they would apply. So, and, and the same for respect and teamwork, because you wouldn't get any good results unless you did it as a team. And if you didn't respect the people that was using um, or, or, or being customers to the problem, there'd be no solution. It'd fade away. So all of a sudden, it all made sense, and there was a huge effect, a huge improvement in performance, and for that, financial matters as well in the organizations outside of Japan. So there's a great learning from there about how Toyota tried to handle a struggle they had. And I see so many companies that works on the values, defines the values, but then spends maybe some time talking about the values, but nothing really happens with it. So it's really important when we're aligning our organization to think through basically how our values is connecting. Right? So that's a little bit on, on making sure we have healthy organizations. Uh, next item, building the ability to execute strategies. Now, this is where we typically start, but I'd always like to say that if, if we feel that our organization is not aligned, is not healthy, take a step back, make sure we have healthy organization first, then we focus on making the executional ability of the organization, because this is really what's going to help us achieve our strategies. Every time we put up new ambition, every time that Hanno provides new challenge for Enix organization, this is the opportunity to really sharpen our organizational ability to deliver this. And we focus on the middle section of this model, accountability, the control process. We focus on the leadership, of course, well, but also the capability building of the organization and the motivation of the organization. 
Doing this will allow us to sharpen our execution. And accountability, it's, it's, um, this is why I was giving you a French or, or giving, uh, giving you a candy since you're from France. I, um, I work with a factory in France quite every now and then. And the factory management team is, is very, I'm Swedish, Swedish people, we, we almost don't say what we really believe. We want everyone to be happy. We sit around and we mushy mushy and talk about things. And whenever somebody says there's a problem, how will you solve it? We will always use the we word. We should consider what to do. We will think about this. Um, we would never say, you're responsible, it was your problem, you fix it. We would always say that we should, very collaborative. In France, I, I, when I was very young and, and did my first project there, I was very shocked by the mentality. I came in, I presented um, findings. Uh, this was a supplier of Toyota, and they were performing really poorly. Uh, I was there for six months to turn around performance. And the first thing to do is quick diagnostics. So I identified main issues they were facing towards us. Um, we made Pareto, I went to management team, presented and said, Ah, here are biggest issues. This one, scratches on armrests, consists of 20% of the problems you have to us. So this we should really focus on improving. Took two seconds, then plant manager, he gets up, very upset, and he starts screaming in French. I don't speak French, because he goes, la 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 merde, merde, something like this. And uh, he starts shouting at quality manager. And quality manager looks like, I don't know. Nothing has happened here, right? This is not my problem. I don't know what's going on. Then all the managers are standing up screaming. They go to whiteboard. This is very nice, by the way. But they, they draw on whiteboard a lot. Then they go kind of explaining this problem. It takes a long time. Then eventually, in, uh, you see how quality manager kind of takes problem and he moves it over to production manager. Now production manager received problem and everyone shouts at the production manager for a while. Eventually it goes through logistics manager and it's back in the knee of quality manager again. And it's 20 minutes later, and they all kind of get the suits back on, they sit down in their chairs and they go, yes, we agree. And I looked and I thought, what did you agree to? What just happened? And it's their extreme, or at least this factory's extreme focus on accountability. But when they had accountability, it took them two weeks to resolve the problem. Just because they cleared out the air and they made sure they had an accountable person who would own the problem, that would own the solution to the problem. So, you know, being really sharp on accountability helps, and it helps a lot. And it's one of these linear relationships where we can get a lot by improving it all the time. Making sure we have clear accountability is not only making sure we have accountability of who owns what target, it's primarily who owns what initiative to achieve the target. There's a very clear difference in executionability of having targets and linking the targets to initiatives. And this is one of the key things. If you can link targets to initiatives and basically get your whole team together and make a big plan of how you will achieve all those initiatives, that will be one of the most important key success factors to get you there. Because if you make the plan, and the plan will deliver your, your, your targets, or your ambition, your vision, you can plan out all the resources, you can plan out all the bottlenecks, you will make sure you will not fail. But if you don't do that, you will make sure you fail. So you will keep using the same resources and tagging the same time along. Now, the model we tend to use for this, it's, it's a lean model. We developed it a few years ago. It, it's basically called the, the, the um, uh, leadership structure model. And it's very simple, but it's so universal. It's applicable for a project team, a site, a, even a, a company, I suppose, if you wanted to. And it basically starts with strategy deployment. So we need to have direction, as we talked about. Then we need to set strategy for how we're going to achieve that. And when we have this clearly defined, we do strategy deployment or Horshin Kanri process, which last time I said is one of the most important processes of any company. And I stand firm that that is really one of the most important ones. And that's taking a vision and a strategy and providing it down to each level of the organization so that there's a clear uh, accountability, but also ownership of the improvements to then drive and make these KPIs come true. Truly important process. Um, when we have that, we make sure we have the right organization. I sometimes I, I come to organizations of, of uh, significant spend. I look into the organization and I see that maybe they don't... Uh, two weeks ago, I went to an organization that had, I think, 100, uh, 100, mil 100 million euros. It's a quite small organization, but 80% of their spend was basically in material and didn't have a purchasing organization. They went around the corner to the local iron shop and basically bought screws and nuts and, and little metal pieces there. And, and you look at that and say 80% of their spend is in, in material and they don't have a procurement organization. Same thing for many organizations. We've let our maintenance departments do all our, all our spare parts shopping, which is just insane. 
So, so sometimes when you look on the strategies you have, and then you look on the organizational design you have to support it, you will see clear lacks. We typically see managers have so many people that they spend pretty much, you know, they, of course everyone spends 60% of their time in meeting, but from the time they have on top of that, they have not, not more than kind of 2-3% of their time to actually spend coaching their employees and making their employees grow. And if you have no time as a manager to coach and develop your organization, you're destined to fail. Your team will not like it, they will leave. You will not like it, you will leave. Because you need time to drive improvement, to develop people. That gives you so much motivation, so much energy. So organizational design, we see so much issues in this. Same with capability development. So when we've defined the right organization to achieve our strategy, next thing to do is identify the gaps in capability. Now, another example that we tend to do is a automotive example, but I think quite related to many of the pictures we saw from your sites. Now, um, when you start job as, a, uh, as an assembly worker in Toyota, I did uh, in 2004, the first thing you do is you go to an offset training school and not until you're a certified assembler are you allowed to go and assemble online. Now what you do is you're trained to pick up nuts and bolts and screws for instance. Um, tack time in Toyota factory is one minute, so you get one minute or sometimes 50 seconds or 70 seconds, but roughly a minute. So every minute a new car comes down the line. And you always pick up a lot of nuts, a lot of screws. And one of the important elements here is being able to do that as efficiently as possible. The first time I was asked to pick up six screws and six bolts with both of my hands at the same time, it took me 28 seconds before I had six in each hand. Because I, I picked down, I grabbed some, I got eight in one and four in one, then I tried to, and I wasn't very good at using both hands at the same time. Um, after some training, during this training school, it took me one second. Always six pieces in my hands. And if you got attack time of one minute and you get variability down from 30 seconds to basically one second, imagine the impact you have of making simple trainings, simple introductions. Same applies, so yeah, that's for production, right? But in offices, we do quite often some, some analysis of what we're spending our, our time on. And um, what we tend to see is we tend to spend something like uh, 30 to 40% of our time working on computer. We're writing emails, we're writing PowerPoint presentations, we're rewriting PowerPoint presentations, we write Word documents. And then we make analysis of the speed that we can type on computer. And we realize that quite easily, all of us can improve our speed. And in very many manufacturing organizations, the average improvement we can make in speed typing, from just using the simple tools that you're trained in in, grads, in junior schools um, to type and type fast, we can improve and double the speed that we're typing in general in the organization, very quickly, very simply. The amount of time you free up from an organization by just typing faster, it really, in the same way as learning to pick bolts quickly, allows you to spend your time on better things. So really, when it comes to capability development, it's both the broad capabilities, problem solving and all this, but also the little things. Because if you take away the variability, it's so much easier to focus on the muda behind it. But when you have loads of variability, you don't see the waste. So this we need to focus on as well. When we start to build this organization, then we use performance management. And we looked a little bit at it in the, 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 the morning as well, in terms of what the strategy would look like on working with this. But that's basically making sure that we have the strategy, we've got the organization for it, we've got the capabilities. There should be nothing stopping us from achieving this, but then problem happens. So now you need to make sure that you're actually having an organization capable of resolving those problems. So that's what this last piece is about. Making sure we capture all abnormalities and make sure we do not fail in our journey to hit our strategy. Now, final piece, and, and um, I know I'm a little bit tight on time, I'm seeing the team saying we should have lunch reasonably quickly, uh, but reasonably quick, uh, on the last thing about aligning our organization to capture innovation, really, um, it's like uh, negotiation. If you've done good preparation, negotiation is quite simple. I do a lot of trainings for procurement organizations and they always ask me the same thing. Teach us negoti the negotiation techniques. This is what you should do. Okay, I tell them I, I won't teach you negotiation techniques. If you want to learn negotiation te techniques, you've already lost the battle. If you're going to try to go into a room and you believe that your skills in negotiating is going to win you the deal to the best situation, you've failed. 
the deal you are closing before the negotiation even starts by making sure that you are factually understanding the situation, that you are collaborative in where you're heading with your other partner, making sure basically that you have all the facts on the table means there's no discussion, there's no negotiation, you just present the facts, the facts are there. You cannot argue with facts. The same thing applies when it comes to innovation. If you build an organization that is healthy, that is capable of executing strategies, it's basically an organization that stands up and takes the opportunities of innovation that kicks your way. Regardless if it's market opportunities or if it's technology, disruptive technology items that kicks in, but you are ready as an organization to embrace innovation. So you need a healthy organization to win the race. Because if you try to get these innovations coming in and your organization is not ready to do it, you will fail. You will invest time and resources in something that won't work. Healthy organization, aligned organization, this is what Lean is really all about. We try to do that on a broad level in our organizations and make them ready for the future. Make them ready to adopt and take on challenges. Make them ready to, to basically um, eliminate uh, future abnormalities using innovation. And we have now about 10 minutes to do some questions and then afterwards we will have you continuing sure. with a workshop and a little bit after that as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, do we have any questions to Jonas and Manoy? There's chocolates for any questions. Ah, good idea. That's a good How idea. How many chocolates do you have? We have lots of chocolates. Lots. That's good, because I can need a couple of them, I guess. So. <laughs> uh, I do have one question, Jonas, and I'm actually thinking about already the next year's theme and the next year Partner Day and say that one of the things we can have in the invitation is actually come to us, join the Partner Day, and at the same time learn to type faster. How long time do you need to actually improve your time of typing with 50%? My personal experience, it took me three days of doing this training. Um, I did the training ten, ten, ten times per day. It took me ten minutes each of the times during the day, and I doubled my performance. So then you need year. to keep it a little bit alive. I mean, if you just yeah. uh, do that and then you leave it, then you fall back a bit. But, but really, it helps. Mm. I want to link back a little bit to what you guys were discussing, or both of you earlier as well. And we saw that the development is going so fast in various areas. We have new industries forming. We have... I mean, you even took up something we all see very seriously, like drinking and driving, that in the future that might even be possible, yes. and that the technology is making it doable. How does it work with legislation and the technological development and also uh, the development of our values as persons, that what is okay and what is not okay? Do you see trends in this area as well? Wow, uh, that's a really tough question. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not best qualified to answer it. Uh, but, you know, let me give you some cultural differences to help uh, understand this. Uh, what is considered as as an as a issue in, let's say, in developed economies is not considered as an issue in many Asian economies, right? Uh, because we are at the developing stage. So we don't care much about, uh, let's say, as much about privacy. We don't care as much about security because we are at a different stage of evolution and we are willing to do things for free, you know, if provided something is free. Uh, so I think different countries and different regions are at different stages of evolution. Uh, that, is, that is number one. Second is, uh, second important thing to consider is, yes, we are concerned about privacy. We are concerned about security. But the reality is that the value that some of these new companies are offering far exceeds our fear of security. And that is why we continue to adopt these services and are willing to share our personal feelings in a public platform uh, without much concern. Because the value that they give us in able to connect to communities, etc., is superior, right? Uh, the third point is the new set of companies are beginning to adopt this well, and they are they realize there is an opportunity to have that address the unmet need of security, privacy, etc. Uber, for example, you know, in Malaysia, it is not always a great experience to take a public taxi. You don't feel secure taking a taxi in the night. Now, Uber guarantees you a secure taxi because there is peer feedback, right? So at the same time, we see the new generation of companies itself adopting it as well. And the good thing is, I believe the, the companies are taking ownership of solving world challenges faster than governments. Uh, and that is very, very exciting. You know? uh, we are 
companies are taking ownership about educating the world faster than what a government in a country can do. Right? So power is now given back to uh, the consumers. Uh, and I think that represents a very fascinating stage of development for you know, the human race, yeah. Okay, any questions? No questions? As you see, I, please. Um, well, like um, in the past decade uh, or maybe the 90s, Japan was a leading influence in terms of like management theories, Kaizen and so on. And then in the past 10 years, we have seen a stagnation of many Japanese companies uh, in the global stage. So, so how do you comment on that? And would you say that these concepts uh, need some type of, um, you know, innovation themselves? Well, good. If, if I start, I, I think uh, absolutely correct observation. To some extent, every, every, you know, the fact that we started to improve our organizations a lot with the focus of, of initially of uh, the, the balanced scorecard, to some extent Taylorism, then adopted Lean and adopted Six Sigma, adopted loads of improvement approach, kind of took us to a level where we took a lot to, away a lot of the initial muda. Um, but the challenge in organizations, if you take the internal view on the organization and not the external on the market, the challenge for organizations is the smarter you get, the more improvement you do, the further you realize that you still have to go. So, so the challenge for organizations is taking the step to actually seize these new improved opportunities that exist. Because the more lean you go, the, the more you realize you still have left to do, right? And this is a challenge. So there's really more opportunities in there, but few companies are capable of capturing the next horizon of improvements. And I think there's loads of opportunities where the, the lean people, well, ourselves, we tend to be a little bit backwards facing. We tend to want things to be manual and very operative in the processes. Uh, but there's loads of opportunities to apply much more intelligent tooling and intelligent system to boost the, the change going forward. I don't know what's your view on, on a sort of external <laughs> point in this. Uh, I'm you know, uh, very, very inspired by the amazing pace at which innovation is happening, particularly in, in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. What started off as innovation focused on technology, uh, computing, and, and internet is now slowly becoming so pervasive, it is spanning across every industry. And I believe that over the next seven, eight years, the U.S. will pretty much be in a very dominant position back in the global economy without, you know, uh, uh, without necessarily owning all the manufacturing facilities around the world, simply because of the power at which innovation is happening uh, within that very small uh, concentrated area which is attracting the best talent in the world, the best capital in the world. Uh, and it is, uh, it is, uh, is going to be challenging for several other global economies to keep pace with that because Clearly, they are at maybe 10x the innovation uh, that is happening in many other parts of the world. Uh, so how do we become part of the ecosystem? How do we, how do we leverage that for our benefit? Uh, I think that remains a, uh, that's a, that's a unique challenge for every CEO, every organization. How do we embrace it? How do we you know, keep relevant in such a fast-moving space? I think this is where organization kicks in. And if you build a strong organization, you're ready to face these challenges, regardless what kind of innovation that you need to use, that you want to use. So, so really focusing on building a strong executionable organization allows you to be ready for whatever challenge the future holds. Okay. I have one question linked to that, and it's also related to the slide you showed, Manoy, with the different areas, the different regions where you see the megatrends coming. And some of the places are and have been politically a little bit unstable, like Egypt being yes. one example. Yeah. How do you see this political instability? Is that only like a temporary hick in the curve of getting there, or might it even change the picture of a map going forward? Correct. I, it's a good point. You know, uh, we have seen so much of an instability in so many different parts of the world. Uh, you know, but you know, we, it's beyond our uh, ability to control many of these things. You have to take a slightly longer term view. You got to build your bets around a multitude of these countries. Uh, we saw Indonesia was in not such a good shape right from 1997 to 2005. Yet in ASEAN. Now it is one of the fastest growing economies. About 300 million people represents a great opportunity to grow. Philippines has been a sleeping country for 30, 40 years. Okay? Uh, but now we have a strong president there, and I think they are beginning to work. So I see a lot of positive momentum happening, which is really enabled by the ability of people to communicate back and demand greater accountability. 
and therefore you have seen very bright prime ministers in many of these countries. Earlier it was not that easy for a young person who is relatively unknown to come and become a prime minister of a president of a country in a very short period of time. But we are seeing that happen in almost every single country now. So I think these are all positive signs that we may, we may, we may see a, a, an era of more economic stability moving forward. Obviously, I, I'm not a, a big prediction of uh, political issues, so I'm not a big commenter. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you first. Uh, is there any internal conflict for uh, focusing on lean and uh, promoting the innovation? Mm. Is there an internal conflict for focusing on innovation versus lean? No, there's not. Um, however, it's really important that we align our organization to focus on the same thing. So in a sense, between innovation and lean, there's no contradictions. There's nothing working against it. Because really, we try to build an organization that's going to be capable of adopting ourselves for innovation, for future. But there might be local issues where we are focusing on the wrong targets short term, which hinders us to face our attention to innovation. So. This exists, yes, um, but it's really not uh, a confluence because really Lean is about building capable organizations. So it's building an organization available to pick up uh, innovation and use the, the minds and hearts of people. Continuous improvement, yes. I, I, I see think innovation you would get a new a, microphone here. Yeah, Can so we please just repeat the three questions so that we also have a chance to get it interpreted? Mm -hmm. So you said that innovation uh, or lean is continuous Im uh, improvement, and thereby you wonder about how is innovation working with continuous improvement? But innovation is a key aspect of doing continuous improvement. When we're looking for the next step change or the next improvements, where are we looking? Well, of course, we need to see what we could do, what improvements we could potentially capture. And innovation is a great way of doing that, right? Because it really helps us looking at the major trends that Manoy was talking about. And there's three steps of, of improvement work you can do. There's Kaizen, or small continuous improvements, iterations in the right direction. Then there's really big changes, really big turnaround improvements. And then there's really visionary total changes. And the total change, that's kind of like uh, the, the trend of, of engineering to zero. So if you say that you're going to really get rid of something, or, or maybe you know, take, a, take a, an EMS manufacturer, why don't you engineer to one hour lead time? If I gave the challenge to a factory and said, you should make lead time of an order in less than one hour, well, let's see how we could do that. That's a great way of driving innovation in processes and applying the kind of improvement and change management uh, methods of lean. So it's all about how you choose to direct your improvement efforts. And if you direct your improvement efforts, like I tried to, to explain, um, towards innovation, you have an organization ready to embrace this and move it forward in the rapid pace. I have one question. Actually, we need to go to lunch very soon. But I have one that I actually would like to ask. And that is related to everything goes faster, everything gets more connected, digital, etc. How long will events like this be possible to last? I mean, thinking that you got together, interacting directly, one full day. Mm. Is it a future for this kind of events? <laughs> I think so, because people love to meet people, uh, and uh, there is not a, nothing better than great interaction. Uh, there are so many alternatives available, but I, I guess I can still foresee, but we have to strive harder to enhance the quality of the experiences when we are together. If, if the event being together is just about somebody standing and everybody listening, uh, then we will not have fun. But if the event means we all get to meet each other and interact and have lots more fun, then it will be there. So the events, the way we do it today, are going to go away. Uh, the e events will, we'll have to integrate faster in bringing the entire audience on stage. Uh, and the sooner we can do that, the better people will keep coming to the events. I was following a conference company in the US. They don't organize events in public areas anymore. So they take people to the companies themselves. So they take you on a visit to Google, and they actually organize the event at Google premises, and you know, created a different kind of an experience. So people are beginning to challenge the norm, uh, but it's a, yeah, it's a good question.
And how do you see it, Jonas? Well, to some extent, I think as long as Mr. Peter Back is facilitating these events, they will uh, <laughs> stay, I would assume. <laughs> no, I, I think as, as uh, Manoj is saying, basically, um, we use innovation and new trends that comes to enhance uh, the outcome and the effectiveness of what we do in these events. To some extent, the face-to-face -face meeting and the kind of event where we share and problem-solve solutions for the future is always going to be important. But when we have all these new gadgets and tools around us, we can make the effect of each and every one of these events so much more powerful. And I think it's really here about not to think about how to make more efficient usage of, of company spending policy, but rather how to get more effect out of the events we do and really boost the outcome of it. And, and that would probably be my view on this question as well.